How's it going guys? Obstructive versus restrictive lung disease for Yosemite and I'm also going to talk about other extremely annoying concepts like shunt dead space, flow volume loops, AA gradient. Okay, so first we're just going to run through some high yield cells. So the type 1 pneumocytes are the long simple squamous cells, most of the surface area of the lung and are responsible for gas exchange. Type 2 pneumocytes are more interspersed. You can see that compared to type 1 pneumocytes, they're not lengthy and thin. And then the, ba the basophilic, the dark staining cells tend to be the macrophages, okay? So you need to know the two functions of type 2 pneumocytes. The first being that they're the stem cell of the lung. So if you get pulmonary damage, they ask you which cell replicates to produce other type 1 pneumocytes. The answer is just type 2 pneumocyte. And then you need to know that type 2 pneumocytes produce surfactants. So they can give you neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, kid born preterm who has dyspnea. They say which the following is most likely to be seen as patient. The answer is decreased lamellar bodies. The student thinks that's very weird, but you need to know that type 2 pneumocytes have specialized organelles called lamellar bodies that produce surfactant. So pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells with cilia. U.S. simply wants you to know line their respiratory tree down in their respiratory bronchioles. So their respiratory bronchioles and below, which would be the so respiratory bronchioles and alveoli, that's where gas exchange occurs. And then terminal bronchioles and above, we don't have gas exchange or very limited in the terminal bronchioles, but pretty much no gas exchange. And we have more ciliated cells going upward. So the ciliated cells, U.S. simply wants you to know that those are the cells that are most fucked up in smoking. Okay, so if you get a question with arrows where they say, uh, what are the activities up or down for alveolar macrophage activity and pseudostratified ciliated cell activity in, the, in a smoker, it's a down arrow for both, which sounds weird because you would think, number one, wouldn't we want increased ciliated cell activity to have increased clearance of particulates? And number two, wouldn't we want the alveolar macrophages to increase in activity to uh, increased clearance of those particulates down the lung, 100%, but it's decreased activity for both. And if you're forced to choose which cell is most fucked up, it's going to be the pseudostratified ciliated cell over the ma alveolar macrophage. So they, uh, the macrophages clear the particulates out of the lung. You have similarly wants to know that TB is going to reside within the macrophages. That makes sense, okay, but it's past level detail. And what they also want you to know is they can give you tuberculosis and say, Activity of which the following cells is most likely to be increased in this patient. Answer is macrophage. Wrong answer. Cytotoxic T cell. The student's confused because they're like, oh, but wouldn't we have increased T cell activity also because T cells are interacting with the macrophages? You're right, but it's CD4 plus T cells interacting with the macrophages, which are known as T helper cells. Cytotoxic T cells are CD8 plus T cells, which are not increased in activity in TB. And then it's a lengthy discussion as far as sarcoidosis is concerned. Talk about this stuff in other YouTube clips and in my PDFs. But uh, autoimmune disease, usually African-American women, 20s to 30s. And she's going to have non-casein granulomas in the lungs that are composed of epithelioid macrophages, a.k.a. histiocytes, that produce 1-off hydroxylase, activating vitamin D. And the 125D3 is going to go to the small bowel, increase absorption of calcium, which can lead to hypercalcemia and suppression of your PTH. So it's just something you got to be aware of. Now, you also really wants you to know that alveolar macrophage is the cell that initiates pulmonary fibrosis. So what they're going to do, it's not limited to asbestosis. I'm just giving you an example here. So this is showing you a ferruginous body, this barbell looking structure, and you can see that it's passing through a cell. That's the macrophage attempting to phagocytose it. So they can just give you any type of uh, lung pathology and just say like, which the following cells initiates pulmonary fibrosis answer is macrophage. And so it's just a fact that I want you to know. Okay. As I already harped on, activities decrease travel macrophage and smokers not increase, even though you would think that uh, activity should be uh, increased. Same with pseudostratified cells. Okay, now this is extremely high yield when we talk about the base of membranes. So they might give you a scenario where they say 83-year-old woman had a pneumonia. She's treated six months later. Chest x-ray shows no abnormalities, uh, which the following... Uh, is most likely responsible for, for restoration of normal tissue architecture in this patient? And the answer is maintenance of basement membranes. And you're like, okay, sounds kind of like a one-off weird question, but noted. And then you get another NDME question where they give you 44-year-old alcoholic who has a pulmonary abscess. He's treated with clindamycin successfully. And then a year later, he has a repeat chest x-ray, which shows a remnant 
cavitary lesion at the site of where that pulmonary abscess was, even though he doesn't currently have an abscess. They say which the following is responsible for failure of restoration of normal tissue architecture in this patient. And the answer is failure of maintenance of basement membranes. And you're like, wow, I didn't realize this was like a concept that repeats. And it also, as per my observation across NBME exams, it's not just limited to lungs. They can give you a patient who cut his skin, okay? Skin on his arm and he's left with a scar and they say, why did this happen? And the answer is failure of maintenance of basement membranes. Okay, or they give you a colonoscopy. They say a patient has a polyp removed. And they say a year later, what are you going to see on repeat colonoscopy at the location where the polyp was removed? The answer is normal mucosa. Holy shit. Students choosing answers like scar. It's not because isn't a polyp superficial to the basement membrane? Polyps aren't invasive, right? So if you have maintenance of the basement membranes, you have normal tissue architecture maintenance. as I just harped on. Kolchitsky cell will not be written as a correct answer. It's going to be written as a distractor. So I'm just telling you sort of as a factoid, it happens to coincidentally uh, be the cell that is the source of the neoplasia, the ideology of the neoplasia for small cell bronchogenic carcinoma. But why am I mentioning it? It's because that question I just discussed about what cell initiates pulmonary fibrosis, students are like, I don't know. Like, how am I supposed to know what cell initiates pulmonary fibrosis? Well, they'll list a bunch of weird cells, Kolchitsky cell, Clara cell, okay? And those are wrong fucking answers. You're just going to choose macrophage. Okay, so we're going to get into the obstructive versus restrictive stuff. So obstructive lung disease is going to be decreased ability to expire air due to lung trapping. Can your ins inspiration phase be affected? The answer is yes but it's predominantly a prolonged expiratory phase due to air trapping. So, and this will result in increased lung volumes, okay? Predominantly an increased residual volume. So total lung capacity is increased. So what they might do is give you eight-year-old boy who has a dry cough, and they tell you there's a prolonged expiratory phase, and that's them just telling you it's asthma, okay? They can give you 44-year-old smoker who's got prolonged expiratory phase, and that might be emphysema starting, okay? Bronchiectasis is dilation of the airways due to loss of musculature within the airways. Restrictive lung disease is inability to inspire fully because of decreased pulmonary compliance, such as fibrosis, amyloidosis, okay? They can give you a history of radiation of the chest causing fibrosis. It can also be neuromuscular uh, related, like myasthenia gravis or chest wall related, but the point is sort of conceptually for starters you say well obstructive that's the one where there's air trapping and our ability to expire is decreased restrictive that makes sense we can't inspire because we're restricted from inspiration okay so restrictive is the one with a problem with inspiring instead now before i get into all of the like comparison of the two well I mean, I'm literally writing as the subtitle above compare comparing them but we're going to talk about lung volumes real quick now Total, uh, total lung capacity, not not sure why I wrote TLR here. What am I going to do, restart the whole fucking presentation? The answer is no, okay? Not to correct this little R here, but total lung capacity, just the amount of air that's in the lungs, okay? So from the residual volume all the way up to maximal inspiration, just total amount in the lungs, it's going to be increased in obstructive and it's decreased in restrictive. And I'll, I'll show you graphs comparing the two as we move through, okay? So don't worry. So vital capacity is just the total amount of air that you're able to inspire uh, that does not include residual volume. So if you uh, maximally exhale, followed by maximally inhale, it's that volume of air. Tidal volume is just the amount of air that goes in and out during normal casual breathing. Inspiratory capacity is after a normal exhalation. Uh, then you inspire the maximum amount that you possibly can. That's, that's your inspiratory capacity. Inspiratory reserve volume after a normal inhalation casual inhalation, it's the additional amount that you can inhale. And likewise, expiratory reserve volume after a casual normal exhalation, it's the additional amount that you can exhale. Functional residual capacity, so this is the residual volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. And then residual volume is the amount of air that's left in the lungs after maximal ex exhalation. Now, by the way, if you need to wrap your head around those, you can obviously pause the presentation and just kind of look at this graph, this chart a bit more, and right, you can do that. Hop, hop back through the slides, of course. So DLCO, this is why I wrote mostly lung volume terms. So I just wanted to throw this in here that 
diffusion capacity of lungs for carbon monoxide, not dioxide. Okay, I know it sounds weird, but DLCO. So this reflects the extent of gas exchange across the pulmonary capillaries, how effective the gas exchange occurs, and all you need to know for you assimilate, cutting through all the bullshit. Okay. DLCO is going to be decreased in all lung pathologies, but it's increased in asthma. That's how it applies to US MLA. All right. So for example, you'll get a big fucking paragraph question, not really sure what's going on. And they'll say somewhere in the paragraph, DLCO is decreased. And you're like, cool, not asthma. Or likewise, they give you a big paragraph and they say in the last line, DLCO is increased. And you're like, answer asthma. You're like, I'm going to just double check, just read the question, 15, 20 seconds, just to make sure. But I'm pretty sure it's asthma because I see DLCO is increased. Oh, yep, it's asthma. Okay, so that's how it applies to US Millie. So now I'm going to talk about the, the terms that we uh, apply to obstructive versus restrictive that are exceedingly high yield for US Millie. So FEV1 is the amount of air you can expire after maximal inhalation, the, the volume of air that you can expire in one second. Force vital capacity, okay? So uh, as you know that this is going to be, as I talked about before with this graph, our vital capacity is the amount of air uh, you can inhale after a maximum expiration. And then we use this ratio to compare the two. So for this is all the past level stuff. Once again, you can pause the presentation if you want to like analyze the chart more and stuff. But uh, you need to know that FEV1 over FEC is decreased in obstructive and it's normal or increased in restrictive, okay? So FEV1 and FEC as independent terms, they are classically decreased in both obstructive and restrictive, but it's the ratio that differs, okay? And the reason the ratio differs is because of something called radial traction, which is a quote-unquote stickiness on the outside of the airways in restrictive lung disease that prevents the airways from collapsing as readily as they normally could. So when we compare obstructive versus restrictive, and I ask students, why is the FEV1 over FEC, why is that ratio greater and restrictive in comparison to obstructive? The answer they give is something along the lines of, well, the numerator doesn't decrease as much as wrong fucking answer. Okay, it's going to be radial traction. So it's stickiness on the outside of the airways that you get in restrictive that you don't have an obstructive, which is why the FV1 in restrictive uh, eclipses that in obstructive. Okay, so you can also be aware that FV1 occasionally can show up normal in a, in restrictive questions. So, for example, there is an MME question floating around where uh, they give you like obvious idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and then they say like, what are the arrows? And you can eliminate. You just say, well, there's only two answers here that are uh, normal slash increased FV1 over FEC. All the down arrow for FV1 over FEC is wrong because it's not obstructive. And then you're left with the only answer that makes sense where total lung capacity is decreased and restrictive. It's not increased. Okay, it's increased and obstructive. And then FV1 can be normal. Holy shit. Okay, so functional residual capacity as we mentioned before, is the ERV plus the RV. Okay, so if I just arrow back here, I just want you to look at this. Functional residual capacity, you see this? So that's your expiratory reserve volume. So after a casual exhalation, you expire all the way. So that's your that additional air, that additional volume that you expire forcefully is your expiratory reserve volume. And then you've got the residual volume, the amount of air left in the lungs. Uh, following that maximal expiration. So the sum of those two, that's your FRC. So this is increased in in uh, obstructive in comparison to restrictive, and it's largely because that residual volume is increased due to air trapping, all right? And those volumes are both decreased in uh, restrictive due to decreased lung compliance. And as I talked about before, the DLCO is going to be decreased on US simile but it's increased in asthma. I put this in parentheses that uh, DLCO can technically be normal in uh, neuromuscular causes. I only did that because occasionally I'll get a hyper pedantic student send me a DM about OMG uh, can be normal. It's like, well, I'm just telling you points for the US simile is not the, the goal here is that you're going to choose decrease for DLCO and everything, but it's increased in asthma. Now, full volume loop nonsense. Okay, tell you exactly what you need to know, not waste our fucking time. Is you're gonna get one of these uh, curves on US simile before you freak out. The curve that goes under the x axis, that's your inspiration, which I labeled here. And then you've got the curve above the x axis, this phase, that's your expiration. Now you see how the obstructive curve looks more concave on the 
the expiration part in comparison to normal and restrictive. You see that? Now I'll come back to this slide in a second, but this, this curve is obstructive as well. See how it looks very concave, right? It looks scooped out. So we go back here. So you got this obstructive curve that looks more concave. So this mean this is the this is the highest yield pass level point. That's like the point you need to know for these flow volume loops. Uh, so this is because of air trapping. So we can't uh, expire as well as we need to. So our flow rate is obviously decreased pretty quickly for obstructive. Restrictive, our problem is not expiration. Our problem is inspiration. So you can see the inspiration curve is severely limited with the restrictive lung condition. And our expiration part is fine. So the curve looks similar to the normal curve for restrictive. It's just the volume's obviously reduced. So once again, you can, if you want to, you can pause the presentation and look at the chart uh, more in depth. But I'm just reiterating the point that you've got this diff the scooped out concave appearance for the obstructive in comparison to restrictive, and that it's the for restrictive you have a diminished inspiration curve. Okay, that's the point here. And then you see how the obstructive curve is wider compared to the restrictive curve. That makes sense because we're talking about a greater volume in the lungs for obstructive lung disease in comparison to restrictive. We can't inhale in restrictive. So what the Yosemite is going to do is show you this Windows 95 bootleg curve, okay? And they might give it to you in a 28-year-old. And they ask you what the diagnosis is with, like, no other information. They And they'll say... Um, so three of the answers might be restrictive, which you can eliminate right away. They may have like sarcoidosis, which is restrictive, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary edema. Okay. Those are all restrictive. You eliminate those because you know, this curve, the scooped out appearance is obstructive. And then you're left with emphysema and asthma. And they might tell you there's no history of any family conditions. And you're like, all right, well, that eliminates alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency as a potential cause of emphysema in a young patient. So if we're just in a vacuum, uh, attempting to assess what the most or discern what the most likely diagnosis would be for an obstructive spirometry curve in a young patient, asthma is way more likely than emphysema, right? So the answer could just be asthma in this case. As I said, that's how you that's the past level point. Not hard once we know that this curve is obstructive. Now, this is also really annoying stuff, okay? The VQ mismatch, but don't worry. Be very clean and concise. Just tell you what you need to know. So V obviously ventilation and Q is perfusion. So a shunt is when you have a decreased V on Q. So ventilation is reduced relative to perfusion. Dead space is increased V on Q. So perfusion is decreased relative to ventilation. Now shunt is going to be the answer for all lung conditions on USMLA. Asthma, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, doesn't matter, okay? It's shunt. Dead space is going to be the answer for pulmonary embolism. Obviously it could be air, fat, amniotic fluid emboli, emboli as well, but PE on US simile when you're trying to remember this. So if you get any lung condition and it's not a PE, okay, it's on, if it's not an embolus to the lung, it's going to be a shunt, all right? Now, when you hear these terms in isolation, shunt dead space, they refer to pathologic, meaning there's a problem in the lung. But you can know that uh, they're not always a problem. Sometimes they can be normal, such physiologic. Now, for example, when the patient's upright, we've got, because gravity is going to pull blood down more than air, at the apices of the lungs, we have relatively more ventilation compared to perfusion. Okay, the gravity's pulled the blood away from the apices. So we have a high VNQ at the apices. So we've got natural dead space, alveolar dead space at the apices. And then at the bases, perfusion is greater than ventilation because we've got all that gravity pulling the blood down, the blood settling. So that uh, decreased VNQ at the bases, we have natural physiologic shunt at the bases, okay? So now I'm just gonna give you some definitions here. So alveolar dead space, as I just talked about, that refers to the natural uh, dead space we have at the apices compared to the bases. Anatomic dead space refers to parts of the respiratory tree, such as the trachea, bronchi, that are ventilated. Obviously air is moving in and out past them, but they're not perfused, they're not partaking in gas exchange. Okay, so it's anatomic dead space. And then the word physiologic means normal. So physiologic dead space, you say, what's the normal dead space in uh, in our respiratory tract? And the answer is gonna be, well, the, the sum of the alveolar plus the anatomic. Now, 
The reason I mention this is because NVMe form, there's a there's an offline question where it's literally a one-liner. They just say like dude has uh, reduced ventilation compared to perfusion. And they say which the following is uh, most likely in this patient. And they have like shunt, alveolar dead space, anatomic dead space, physio physiologic dead space. And the student is psychoanalyzing and is like, ooh, well, it must be one of the dead spaces because they list three. It's fucking wrong. Okay. So if you know your definitions, passel, it's easy. You just say, well, they said decreased ventilation compared to fusion. I just know that that's a shunt. Now, A gradient, very fucking annoying stuff for everybody involved. Okay. So capital A, alveolar oxygen, D, uh, uh, little a is going to be arterial oxygen. And this just tells us whether we have normal respirations, sufficient respirations or not. In other words, if A gradient is increased, it means our respirations are normal. And it means that our lungs are fucked up in some way. Okay, so it could be in, impeded gas exchange, pulmonary fibrosis, shunt dead space. The lungs are fucked up in some way, but a high A gradient tells us our breathing is fine. A normal A gradient tells us our, our respirations are insufficient. So now I'm putting it in text for you to look at. So as I just said, if the A gradient is high, the lungs are fucked up, and there's a problem such that there could be fibrosis there, impeding the gas exchange. Uh, there could be fluid in the lungs, right? You've got pulmonary edema, let's say, or ARDS. So the air, the patient's uh, respirations are, are perfectly fine. It's just you can't get that, that oxygen across the alveolar capillaries and the uh, arterioles ultimately. So that's high A gradient. Then a normal A gradient means you have insufficient respirations. So this is going to be the patient's hypoventilating from benzos, barbiturates, opioids, heroin. Okay. Now what they can do is tell you, let's say a patient came out of surgery, is on oxycodone, respirations are six per minute. They should be 12 to 16 per minute. And the arterial oxygen is low. And they'll say, which the following is most likely to be seen as patient? And they'll have different answer choices, like high A gradient. It's fucking wrong. Okay. Students like students assume that if you've got low O2 sets, that high A gradient, holy shit, sounds very buzzy. It's fucking wrong if you're hypoventilating. They said patients on an opioid, okay? So that's a normal A gradient, the patients hypoventilating from drugs. Now, I mentioned this as far as numbers are concerned, because Students have a way of complicating things. They'll say, well, I don't know like the numbers for A gradient. You don't fucking need to, okay? If they give you a patient who OD'd on benzos and is hypoventilating and has low O2 sets, and they ask you for arrows, you're obviously going to choose an increase, an up arrow. Or let's say they ask you for numbers, okay? So normal CO2 is 33 to 44, so you're going to choose a high number, let's say 50 or 60 for CO2. Normal O2, normal O2 sats are 80 to 100. O2 is not O2 sats. O2, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, will be 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So you'll choose a low number, like 50 for O2. And then for the A gradient, students like, well, I don't know. Well, between 40 and 10, doesn't 40 sound like the high A gradient? But 10 sounds like a normal A gradient? No such thing as low A gradient for Yosemite. Don't worry about that. It's just elevated or not elevated. So in a patient who took who OD'd on heroin or opioid benzo you're going to choose the lower number, okay, which happened to be 10 in that case. And as I mentioned before already, if uh, like pulmonary edema, uh, that can be a cause of high gradients. So what they'll do is give you a patient who has left heart failure, myocardial infarction as dyspnea, and of course that's backing up, blood backing up to the, the lungs and you've got increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure transitation to the alveolar spaces. So you got the pulmonary edema there, the fluid there impeding gas exchange, but the respirations are fine, aren't they? Patient's not hypoventilating due to drugs or anything, so the respirations are fine. And they list like 10 answers, and the answer is just high AA gradient. Okay, so I'm just letting you know that it's that simple, but students tend to make things complicated. I want you to know that healthy people over the course of life due to aggregate inhalation of particulates eg or ie from car exhaust or secondhand smoke essentially acquire quote unquote very slow copd okay so if you're forced to choose arrows for what you'd expect in a healthy 70 year old versus a 20 year old you're going to choose arrows consistent with obstructive lung disease rather than restrictive lung disease. So you choose high A gradient because you say, well, the lungs are fucked up. That makes sense. Okay. And decreased arterial PO2. That makes sense. 
you choose increased total lung capacity. All right, so obstructive, you have increased TLC due to air trapping, super high residual volume, whereas in restrictive lung disease, you have decreased total lung capacity due to decreased lung compliance where residual volume is significantly reduced. And then they want you to know, they want you to know that normal AA gradient is also seen in patients on ventilators with high CO2. Okay, they tell you patients on a ventilator and the CO2 is high and they want you to choose normal AA gradient for that. It's because the respirations are insufficient. Okay, obviously patients can be on ventilators for any number of reasons. But I'm just telling you that if they give you a high CO2 in a patient who's on a ventilator, that's going to be insufficient respirations from the ventilator, and you're going to choose a normal A gradient. All right, guys, obviously, obstructive versus restrictive, other things annoying like V on Q, flow volume loops, A gradient. I'm going to continue making more content and subscribe to my channels, and that's it.